Um, what I'm going to do today a little bit is talk to you a little bit about other journeys. And um, I've decided to, to talk a little bit about brain tumor genetics. And if I have a little time at the end, I'll talk about uh, brain tumor uh, simulation too. But um, I'm really going to talk about a number of things. Number one, I'm, I think there's an issue about the extent of surgery concept. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, maybe I can get Dennis to come up and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about treating fields trial that was done. I'm going to talk about a little tiny bit about vaccines and checkpoint inhibitors and possibly some viruses and then, and then a little bit if I have some time in the end. What I wanted to talk about mostly, I think, was the concept of sort of starting to change the, the idea and trying to help you understand what is really involved with the cancer situation. And as I said, in, in when we had the, the panel discussion, um, can people see from this side or am I in their way? I'm not in your way? I'm just, okay. So basically what, what happens here, if you think about neoplasia or cancer, is that there's some change that occurs in a cell. And that change occurs in a particular set of genes. It can be a number of different genes. But within our cells, we have these multiple genes whose only purpose is to prevent cancer. It looks like through the evolution of time, obviously animals and other sort of types of species who had these particular genes were able to survive much better and therefore they ended up in our particular system too. In these particular genes, there's, there's probably somewhere around 500 of them. So there's a lot of them. And what they do continuously is, is to continue to do that for us. So something happens in one of these genes or a set of these genes, and then that initiates a tumor or a lump, basically. And then what happens is that lump grows. That's basically the, the whole concept related to cancer. So initially, all the, all the cells look exactly the same. They all have that one mutation, that one change, and we can follow that one change. Unfortunately, what happens afterwards, though, is that more changes occur. More mutations, changes occur. So in any given malignant tumor, there's multiple different cells with multiple different changes, and that's what makes them difficult to control. If we only had one mutation to control, it'd be much easier to do it. But unfortunately, with a lot of cancers, like lung cancer, like cancers of the brain, we have multiple types of mutations. So it's, it makes it very difficult. And so I'm not gonna get fancy here. I don't want you to really look at this, except to see that, that if you take older adults, they have these specific mutations. You start with this mutation and you have a bunch of other ones who occur and you get a glioblastoma. If you're a younger person, you tend to go through a different pathway. And, you know, people have talked about um, this IDH1 mutation. There's another mutation called this. And so there's different pathways. So what we're beginning to find out is that each person is different related to their cancer. You have different mutations than the other person who has a particular type of the same cancer. Because you are an individual. Your cells are individual. Your environment is individual. And each individual has different types of, of cells and different types of these changes. So if you look at it then, we start off with some type of cell that has a particular mutation. And then sometimes that causes what's called a low-grade tumor. And we found the mutations that seem to be very important for these low-grade tumors now. And then other mutations occur. And, and then over time, you can develop other types of tumors. This may take 10 to 15 years different and different people depending on what mutation you happen to have. Just that's the way it is. And other people, for example, that have oligodendrogliomas, they also have different types of mutations. You see here that you don't have the 1P19Q here, here that you have here. You have these other types of mutations. And again, they can go down and cause difficulty. The real problem appears to be, and it's difficult to understand why this happens genetically, is how do you go from having a precursor cell, having this particular mutation, and then suddenly in a period of maybe a couple of months or weeks, 
go to having a very large tumor that's what we call a glioblastoma. So different tumors grow differently depending on what type of mutation you happen to have there. The other thing that's interesting is that pediatric tumors are very different. They're very different genetically than are adult tumors. And one of the things that always was an interest to me is when I was doing a lot of pediatric neurosurgery was, why was it that certain patients had tumors that looked under the microscope on the MR scan exactly the same, a 17-year-old, let's say, who has a particular tumor, and a, and a 60-year-old, they look exactly the same. Under the microscope, they looked exactly the same. But in the pediatric situation, they never advanced. They always stayed the same. So some tumors in pediatrics go to a particular level, and then they seem to stop, and they never develop anything more malignant. So something happens in that particular group of patients. Other tumors are basically the same. Let's go back here. Are basically the same as we find in, in, the, um, in the adults. What's happening in the pediatric world is each individual tumor is being sort of very carefully outlined genetically. And they're moving very, very quickly to try and work out each tumor and how it is different. And even in the medulloblastoma, which is a very common tumor, there's four different subtypes and probably more. So not every tumor is the same, not every tumor in each individual is the same. Now, what's the big picture? Well, the big picture is that you have, tumors have a big mass, and many times surgeons like me and Dr. Megacy and all the surgeons that are involved can remove that mass. And if you can remove that mass, particularly if it's a, a, a benign type of tumor that only has a few types of mutations, you may not have any trouble at all. Meningiomas in our example. But unfortunately for most of the tumors, we have a situation. Sure. It seems to be really tough. I couldn't. You know what I can do? Ta-da! Now, I should have thought out of the box. Should I not have? I can dance and do everything at once. So we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. So, anyway, so as I was saying, if, if you can think about it now, we have this one big lump, and then we have these smaller groups of cells that tend to invade, as Dr. Megacy was talking about. They probably are genetically different. They're not the same as the ones that stay in the center. So they, they tend to, to leave. And why they may leave is they're different cells. They have different genetics, and they have, in an evolutionary way, they, they move out. So what about removal of tumors? Well, as Dr. Megacy said, I'm not going to talk very much about that. There has never been a trial in which, for example, half the patients have not had the tumor removed, who have, let's say, certain types of tumors, like, let's say, a malignant glioblastoma, and the other half have not had an operation. No one has ever been able to do such a trial. But the bottom line is the, tumor, the trials that have been done certainly suggest that if you can get the vast majority of the tumor out, in other words, you don't see it on the MR scan as that enhancement that Dr. Megacy and Dr. Mulman were talking about, that helps, no question. The second thing is, that if you can get a piece of that tumor, you can get this information that we're beginning to talk about, about the genetics. And also you can put that tumor in the tumor bank. And then as more information comes forward, you can pull that tumor out and find out what was your tumor really like? Why do you do much better or much, or not have done so well as other people? And by having that, it's, it's like interest in a bank. You put the tumor in a bank, and when the information comes out that's more advanced, they pull your tumor out of the bank and try to figure out why you have done well or why you haven't done so well and can we do something else to help you in particular. And there are new things coming along, uh, things called 5-ALA, I'll talk about that a little bit, and it may help you related to improving your clinical symptoms. So I just wanted to, uh, to look into a few of these things. There does seem to be evidence in the very malignant tumors if you take out, you leave a, no residual, you do much better than if you have even small amounts of tumor present. Which tends to suggest that 
even a little bit of tumor left that we can see can sometimes, if you have the proper genetics, that tumor will regrow very quickly. In other cases, it doesn't happen because you may have removed those funny cells. Think about it this way. I have 100 cells there, of which five are bad. The other 95 are not so bad. They don't have the bad things. But just by removing part of the tumor, you remove all five of those bad cells. In some situations, that's really helpful. But if you leave one or two of those bad cells, although you remove 95 of the rest, unfortunately the tumor can come back. So it's a bit like dealing with, with that type of world. There's a new system which is called 5-ALA, and that system outlines a tumor like this. And some, in some centers, people are using that to try to improve the, the removal. The tumors light, out, light up under the microscope and you can see them more. There's a number of different systems that are being developed for that. The other thing I'll tell you is, we talked about MGMT. Well, if you have the particular mutation of MGMT and you have a big removal, you tend to do better than if you don't. That seems to be what's happening in the, in the world. So what about if you do have this type of glial tumor, an oligodendoglioma, an ependymoma, glial type of tumor. Well, there's all types of things to do preoperatively to help you find out where the tumor is and where your other important things are. You can use, uh, uh, operate on awake or, or sleep, depending on what happens. And we have all kinds of ways of trying to improve the removal of the tumor. So in the essence of it, what it generally means is that the data is supportive if you have a primary or recurrent malignant glial tumor, that if you can get all the tumor out that we can see on the MR scan, and now people are talking about what's called a super maximal resection. We won't get into that. But there, and not cause a risk to the patient, that may be reasonable. That's probably the best thing. But you have to remember that you don't want to risk causing damage to the patient. Because you don't know in that patient whether by removing that 95%, you've removed most of those bad cells and the other ones may not grow as quickly. You just don't know that in that patient. So this is the story with MGMT, just showing you that if you do have the uh, methylated MGMT promoter, what basically happens is you just live longer. I'm not gonna go into it. We talked about it a little bit before. So as Dr. Megacy was talking about temozolomide. We know that temozolomide is useful. We know that other markers influence, like this IDH1 mutation, this 1P19Q mutation, and there's another mutation that's called ATRX. This seems to be a bad, bad mutation. Even if you have a low-grade tumor, but this particular gene is mutated, your tumor acts almost like the malignant glioma. This particular gene seems to be very important and we're gonna to have to focus on this one more to try to understand it and develop ways to figure it out if it's in your tumor from that aspect of it. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about was something that, you know, we talked about it with, um, with Dennis. I was involved in this, this particular type, this, tumor, this particular trial in the sense that I, I reviewed it for Canada. I didn't think it was going to work at all. What was this trial? Well, this trial was a trial in which, Dennis, why don't you come up? Why don't you come up? This was a trial in which you placed electrodes on people's heads. You had to shave the hair off. You place electrodes on people's heads. And then you also have, here he is, here he is. And on top of that, you have a battery, right? You carry around a battery on your back <laughs> and it puts, it pulses into your brain alternating currents again and again and again, very, very quickly. From one side to the other, from one side to the other. If you think about this, it's sort of weird. That's the only way you can think about it. But if you looked at certain things, this is how it's set up, right? You can see, and this is have it here. And he can talk to you about this because it's sort of interesting. And, but in the lab, what was fascinating was if you use these currents on malignant cells, what happened was 
that when the cells were trying to divide, what happens when a cell tries to divide? It makes these huge strings and it picks up your, your, your chromosomes your, and it push, pulls them apart. So you can have the same number of chromosomes in both cells. You have to divide each, each of your chromosomes. These alternating turns damaged these cables, broke them all up. And therefore, when the cell was trying to make two cells, what happened is that these weren't pulled apart and both cells died. It's rather remarkable that that would happen, but it seems to happen in the, in the, uh, in the uh, model situation, in the, in the uh, cells in the laboratory. So what basically happened then is people looked at, let's say you have a recurrent tumor. We don't really have good evidence for recurrent tumor. No, wait for one more second here. <laughs> I like it, I like it, have them here. What we have is a recurrent tumor. This, this treatment was just as good as every other treatment that we had. It was no worse, as good. Then what happened is we did a trial and it was presented and it's actually better than everything we have now for glioblastoma. The results are better. In fact, the trial had to be stopped because patients who were having this treatment did better than patients who weren't. Now you've got to remember that patients who were not having this treatment had the electrodes put on their head, had the battery, had to do everything else. The only thing was it wasn't turned on. So each group did exactly the same thing. In one group it was turned on, in the other group it wasn't, and the people it was turned on, it did better. So what is the problem then? Why isn't it being used? Well, in the United States, it's being used. In Europe, it's being used. The trouble is the cost. And the second problem is the battery. Tell us, Dennis, what you have to do with the battery. So the battery is a pain in the you-know-what to deal with. Um, so this is one battery. This is a battery. It is about... It's not, it's not that light, it's about the size of a, you know, I guess a tablet or something, but it's maybe like 10 times as heavy as a tablet. Um, and on top of that, you have, uh, you know, this whole backpack, like with a device and one battery is about 10 to 15 pounds, possibly. So of course, with glioblastoma, where you have, you know, um, I don't know, what, what, what's the median, um, age of diagnosis? Well, it depends. The most, most people who do this are younger people. And the second group, most of them happen to be males. And the reason you want to be a male is because you shave your head. You have to shave your head for this. So that, most people were, were younger. Yeah, so on top of that, these batteries here, each of them last three hours. This is like when you start using them by the I've been using this for exactly two years now uh, this one two hours maybe um, so sadly uh, you can plug the device into the wall however um, I actually have it but it's in my car but the um, the actual plug into the wall is, is terrible it's clunky it's big it's it's bulky it's not something you just want to carry around and there's no room in the backpack for it it's a pain that you know what, yeah. And finally, to charge these things, you need to carry around something the size of a microwave, plug it into the wall, it charges three at a time, and it takes about six hours to charge a single battery. So, it kind of sucks. But. Now, what's happened now is, think about the battery car now, and the problem you have with the car. Well, this is the same issue, right? You, you can't charge these batteries, this is the problem new batteries have been developed. A whole group of new batteries which weigh much, much less, can be charged much better. So when the battery information comes along about battery cars, and, and this is gonna make a massive change. So what I think the future will be, will be a little system on your, on your belt. You'll still have to have the electrodes on your head, but this will be the new system that's gonna be involved. So the problem, what is the problem? Neither the Canadian sort of health system 
the Ontario Health System has agreed to pay for this system. And so therefore, because he was in a, Dennis was in a trial, and therefore he can continue this for as long as he wants, it's now over two years, and, but unless you're in, you were in that trial, you don't have access to it unless you want to pay for it or unless you have insurance to pay for it. So one of the things that, that we've talked about and maybe the Brain Tumor Foundation should at least think about is, is there a way that we can, you know, suggest to the government that this system may be something reasonable because it works as well as temozolomide and better than temozolomide. And there obviously is a subgroup of patients in which it works really well. Two years. It's been two and a half years since his diagnosis. So maybe that's something we should think about. And I'm just bringing this up because it's something that I, as a researcher, would have never thought would work. And that's why sometimes you have to think out of the box a little bit about cancer, about disease, and have other approaches that we don't normally think about. And then on top of that, the hope would be that in the next year or so, this system would be much cheaper because the battery will not be such a problem. Yeah. yeah. In the States, it's 21000 a month, 30000 Canadian a month. That's the problem. That company wants to get its money back in about two months. Yeah. Very quickly, he can stop this anytime he wants. Most patients who were on it were on it for one year. But if they were doing well, because they were in the trial, they were given the rights to have it f for the rest of their lives. They can stop it in it, if he wants, have it for the rest of his life. So, again, just wanting to show you that, that there are newer ways coming forward that we may have to incorporate into our system. And the real cost of this system is the battery in the charger of the battery. So if that problem is dealt with, rather than spending that much, it may drop the price amazingly in the next couple of years. So it might be something hopeful. So, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is an amazing breakthrough that is happening in cancer in other areas. Now, I'll just give you a little antidote. I'm in medical school, first year. That's a long time ago. Really. My immunological teachers tell me that we can cure cancer. Cancer is just a disease like an infection. We can cure cancer, it won't be a problem. We'll do it in a couple of years. And they believe that. 10 years went by, 20 years went by, 30 years went by, 40 years went by, and it didn't work. Multiple times it didn't work. But we knew two things. We knew that certain types of patients, and my wife and I uh, have seen some. I can tell you about a patient who had a disease called malignant melanoma. It's a skin disease, a cancer of the skin. This individual, I had taken care of because of a number of things, ended up with these skin lesions all over his body, from the top of his head to his toes, all over his skin, and they're black. There's no question what they are. And I had said to him when I saw him that you know, it's really nice seeing him again, but I thought he maybe should go to a palliative care unit and something like that, and, you know, gave, gave the feelings I would talk to a person when I'm not going to see them again. Six months later, he came back to see me. He walked in, and he had not one lesion on his whole body. They were all gone. What had happened is his body had begun to attack this tumor as it attacks bacteria, as it attacks viruses, and it killed every single cell in his whole, every single tumor cell in his whole body. So that occurred in malignant melanoma every once in a while, and sometimes with cancer of the kidney, that would also occur. So there is this idea that possibly this could occur. So be, people began to try to understand why it was occurring in this particular type of tumor. So immunotherapy, if, if you want to think about it, its design is a way to boost or is restore your immune system to fight infections and cancer. Think about it this way. When you hit your arm, what happens is, and you damage it, all kinds of cells come to that area, especially if there's bacteria there, 
you mount a huge response to kill those bacteria. Literally millions of your cells are activated to kill that bacteria. How does a, how does a vaccine work? Well, they give you a shot of part of that virus in your arm. Your body thinks you're being attacked by viruses. It attacks this part. Generally, you get a bit of a fever, not too much, but the body now knows that, knows that cell, knows that, that particular viral particle. If it ever sees that viral particle again, it attacks it like crazy. It puts all its effort into destroying that virus because it knows that virus is bad. So that's how vaccines work, okay? So it would seem logical if you get the, 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 the body to attack tumor cells, would it work the same? So I'll talk about how this is being done. So just very, very quickly, I just want to show you there's two types. There's one where you get passive immunity and you produce antibodies or something, and then you develop vaccines which last forever. So potentially, if you have a vaccine, for example, there's a virus that causes carcin uh, cancer of the cervix in, 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 uh, in females and genital cancers in males. If, however, you vaccine, use a vaccine against that virus, when that virus tr attacks your cells, what basically your, your body has seen that's that virus before and eliminates it immediately. So it can't count cancer because it's immediately killed. So that's why that particular system works. And that's why all your male and female young people should be immunized against that, vi that particular virus because we can remove carcinoma of the cervix from the face of the earth by using a vaccine. Rather remarkable situation. So what happens? Well, let's say you have a tumor. A tumor on its surface has various types of molecules. What the tumor does then, being very smart and it wants to live, it surrounds itself with protective molecules that doesn't, that doesn't allow the normal body to see it. And therefore, the body can't figure out that it's abnormal because it's surrounded by a shell that protects it from being seen. And so, what you can do is if you find a protein on the tumor cell that is different from the protein in the brain, and then you develop a sort of type of vaccine against that protein, and you inject it into a patient, maybe the body will see the protein in the site you've injected in the arm, figure out that that is bad, go to the brain tumor and destroy the brain tumor. Because it's the same as if you had an infection or you had a virus. You're basically turning the tumor into a virus by using the vaccines. So this particular trial is being done now, and we should in six months or a year figure out if you have this particular protein in your tumor, we can vaccine, use a vaccine to get rid of it. It's a rather interesting way of going. Now, the other thing that is revolutionized, revolutionized cancer at the present time, there's one called checkpoint inhibitors. Put it down, checkpoint inhibitors, look it up on the internet and, f and think about this. Because what's happening now is, as I mentioned, the tumor cell protects itself by coating itself, preventing the normal cell from figuring out who it is, that it's bad. And then if you can think about what happens if you hurt yourself with an infection, first you have an infection, then the cells go in and actually makes the area swell. That's why you have a swelling if you have an infection. And then the body takes care of it. So the same thing should happen with a tumor. Your body attacks the tumor, thinks it's an infection, destroys it, but at the same time puts huge numbers of cells. Our cells are mobilized to kill that, that particular tumor. So the tumor actually grows. For a period of time, it grows. And then it, as those cells are killed, it goes back to normal. So what happens? Well, here is a tumor, and the cell is trying to figure out that it's bad. The tumor sends out a particular compound, and that particular compound prevents the cell from ever figuring out it's a tumor. That's called the checkpoint. It checks. They've now developed drugs that block 
the checkpoint, the cell can now see the tumor and kill it. And it's called a checkpoint inhibitor. Not only sees the tumor in one place in your body, if the tumor is any place else, it will see it there too. Because it's just like, just like a, the immune system is now working. So now there's different types of these receptors that are known on our cells, and there's different types of antibodies that are formed. These are some of the drugs that are now being used. I said it yesterday, and I'll say it today. The only tumor that is probably worse than a glioblastoma in the sense of not being able to be helped in the last sort of 10 or 15 years has been malignant melanoma, a skin tumor that spreads to the rest of your body. This person that's all black that I talked about. So the decision was to proceed with attacking those types of, of, of patients first. Their normal lifespan after you have malignant melanoma in the rest of your body is about three to four months. That's how long you live. When these checkpoint inhibitors were started to be used, 70 to 80% of the patients survived and were cured. Literally cured. The tumor did not come back. Imagine that. A tumor that normally would, would kill people in a couple of months now are being cured because what happened was that these checkpoint inhibitors allowed your body to know that it was a tumor, rallied the whole immune system to destroy that tumor, and destroyed it wherever it was. It's like suddenly what, what happens in an infection situation. Now, the problem with the brain is that the brain is a bit immunologically protected. It doesn't have as active an immune system as other parts of the body, so there may be problems. But potentially, I think that this is one way of attacking the tumors in ways we've never attacked them before. Well, what about viruses now? Can we, can we make viruses that sort of attack particular areas? And for the very first time, and I just heard it at a Congress meeting, it was at a week ago, a type of tumor that is present in the rest of the body now appears to be able to be killed by viruses that are injected into that tumor in multiple different sites. So that's the first, first proof of concept that maybe it will work. So that might be something that's coming along. How does that work? Well, what you do is you take this virus, you put it into the brain, it goes along and kills the tumor cell, and when a virus kills the cell, it releases many more viral particles to kill all the other cells around, but that virus will not kill a normal cell. So it doesn't kill your normal cells, it just kills the tumor cell. You, you engineer it to do only that. And therefore, just like in the other situation, you were able to kill more and more cells because they release more and more viruses. And when every single tumor cell is gone, the virus can't do anything more, so it just basically goes away, just like it happens uh, with, with a normal infection related to a virus. Maybe I should stop there, but I'll, I'll just go two more things. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna show you some of the things that one can do. One of the things I've been interested in in doing is that how do we train our residents and the new population of, of surgeons to do better operations? How do we do that? I've always been a bit interested in that problem because as a teacher, you would like to have your students being better than you are. And how do you teach them to be better than you are? So you can teach by using books, by using being in the opera room and learning, and by using simulators, sort of the same idea that pilots are trained by using simulators that you know about. And you can begin by using these simulators to ask questions. And if you look at a normal operating room, a normal operating room nowadays looks much like a pilot, it's a pilot aircraft. It's, much, it's very complex, all kinds of complex stuff in there. So can we use simulation just like they use simulations? In airplanes, most of the factors that are involved in causing problems are outside of the pilot. The pilot doesn't cause most of the problems, although they do cause some. In the upper room, it's usually the tumor uh, and the surgeon together that somehow result in problems. So what's happened in the pilot world? Why don't we have planes going down all the time like they used to? Well, 
There used to be lots of accidents, and then they develop early warning systems, like we now have in the operating room. We have heart monitors, we have all kinds of things in the operating room and the ICU to, to monitor, just like they do in planes, right? Everything's the same. Then they put in flight simulators, which substantially decrease the number of accidents. Why? Because you train your pilot in the simulator before it actually happens and figure out how to, how to deal with it. So can we train surgeons the same way? The third thing that happened was human factors. Began to train everybody in the operating room, everybody on the ward, everybody in the intensive care unit to try to do better from that aspect. We haven't gotten to this part yet in medicine. We're just beginning to use simulators. So this is just one that I've been involved with. The essence of the situation is engineers are so good now that they can simulate anything. We can simulate a heart transplant, we can simulate it, uh, and not only can we simulate it, we can make it feel like you're really doing the operation in the simulator. And then we can design any operation you want. This, for example, is the gray matter, the white matter, the brain. Here is... But basically the idea being that you can simulate a whole operation from that aspect of it. Design various types of, of, types of tumors to operate on. And then the next phase will be we take your tumor from your, you as a patient, put you into an MR scan, take that, put it into a simulator, and the surgeon can operate on your tumor the night before or the day before and figure out what the problems are going to be. And if they want, they can send that tumor to anybody in the world that has another simulator and get feedback back and, and begin to talk to each other and say, what is the best way of operating on this tumor to cause the least amount of trouble? And that's the next phase that's coming now. What's interesting is we have the first phase, and the, the Harper government did not allow us to move ahead with the second phase. They just stopped the, they stopped the program. So there you go. We were, we were ranked number one in all Canada. But guess who got the money? The oil people. Just to show you what happens in the real world. So the problem, you know, all of us can think about solutions to patient pro, uh, improving patient lives. Uh, you know, we have to improve education, training, and we have to really dream of a better future. And maybe sometimes we have to think out of the box a little bit more than we have been doing in the past related to these things. Thank you very much.